A motor is a device that converts electrical energy into mechanical energy. This mechanical energy is in the form of a turning motion. The turning motion can be used to drive a load that is coupled to the motor. The turning motion is produced by the interaction of magnetic fields that are created in the motor. When two magnetic fields interact, they can cause an object, such as the rotating part of a motor, to move. This movement is called motor action. We can use this simplified illustration to see how motor action occurs in a DC motor. In this illustration, the rotating part of a DC motor, called the armature, is represented by a loop of wire. The loop of wire is positioned in the magnetic field created by two permanent magnets. The loop is connected to a DC power source, which is not shown. As current flows from the negative side of the DC power source through the loop to the positive side, it produces a magnetic field around the wire. The poles of this magnetic field are perpendicular to the loop. The north pole is here, and the south pole is here. In order to show how the magnetic field around the loop interacts with the magnetic field of the permanent magnets, we'll represent the poles of the loop with a bar magnet. The bar magnet is pivoted so that it's free to rotate. With the bar magnet in this position, the two north poles are next to each other, and the two south poles are next to each other. The like poles repel each other, so the interaction of the magnetic fields causes the bar magnet to rotate. The rotation or movement of the bar magnet is an example of motor action. As the bar magnet rotates, the repelling forces decrease because the like poles are getting farther apart. The bar magnet's north pole is attracted to this permanent magnet's south pole, and the bar magnet's south pole is attracted to this permanent magnet's north pole. The attracting forces increase as the unlike poles get closer to each other. So when the unlike poles are closest to each other, the attracting forces are the greatest. At this point, the bar magnet would stop unless it had enough momentum to carry it past the poles of the permanent magnets. To keep the bar magnet rotating, the polarity of either the bar magnet or the two permanent magnets must be changed. In a DC motor, what is changed is the polarity of the armature, which is represented by the bar magnet in this example. To see how this is done, we'll again use a loop of wire to represent the armature. And we'll add two components called brushes, and a conducting ring known as a commutator. The brushes are connected to the DC power source. The commutator is mounted on the end of the armature so that it can make sliding contact with the brushes. The commutator is not a solid ring. Instead, it consists of conducting segments that are separated from each other. With this arrangement, current flows from the negative side of the DC power source through one brush to a commutator segment. From the commutator segment, the current flows through the armature in this direction. It then flows through the other commutator segment to the other brush, and then to the positive side of the power source. The current flow through the armature creates a magnetic field. The interaction between this magnetic field and the magnetic field produced by the two permanent magnets causes the armature to rotate. In other words, motor action is produced. Even though the armature has turned, the current still flows from the negative side of the power source through the armature to the positive side of the power source. However, the commutator has physically changed the direction in which the current flows through the armature. This change in direction changes the polarity of the armature's magnetic field. So the brushes and the commutator in a DC motor enable the armature to change its magnetic field and as a result the armature continues to turn. The example we just saw was simplified to help make things clear. Both the construction and the operation of actual DC motors are more complex. For example, Instead of a magnetic field created by permanent magnets, a DC motor usually has a magnetic field created by electromagnets called field coils. 
Now, one of the forces created during the operation of a DC motor that you should be aware of is known as armature reaction. Armature reaction is a movement or shift in the magnetic field created by a DC motor's field coils that is caused by the rotation of the armature. Unless armature reaction is compensated for, it can result in damage to the motor's brushes and commutator. To compensate for armature reaction, pieces called interpoles are installed between the field coils in many DC motors. Magnetic fields created around the interpoles oppose any shift in the magnetic field created by the field coils. This is a typical DC motor that has been disassembled so that its parts can be identified. The first part we'll look at is the motor's frame, which is also called the yoke. The frame supports all of the other motor parts and is the part generally used to mount the motor on its foundation. These are the main field poles. They consist of coils, which are the motor's field coils, wrapped around the iron cores called field pole pieces. The field coils are electrically connected to a DC power source. The field pole pieces are usually bolted to the frame. Main field poles are always in north-south pairs. The armature is the entire rotating assembly. It includes the shaft, the armature core, the armature windings, and the commutator. The shaft supports the armature and allows it to turn. The armature core supports and houses the armature windings, which are the current carrying conductors. The armature windings are connected to the commutator. The points on the commutator where the actual connections between the windings and the commutator segments are made are called risers. The risers are protected by and held in place under a wrapping of varnish coated fibers. Current flows from one commutator segment through the armature and back through another commutator segment. The commutator makes sliding contact with a set of brushes. The brushes, which are fitted into holders, are held against the commutator by brush tensioning devices. The brushes provide a path for current flow from the power source to the commutator. Attached to the brush holders are brush pigtails, which serve as the connection points between the brushes and the brush holders. The brush holders are supported by brush rigging. Most DC motors have one set of brushes for each main field pole. There is a negative brush for each south pole and a positive brush for each north pole. In addition to the main field poles, this motor also has interpoles to help compensate for armature reaction. As is usually the case, an interpole is smaller than a main pole piece and it has a coil wound around it. The interpoles are bolted to the frame. The motor's end bells have two functions. They support the brush rigging, and they also house the bearings that support the armature. The end bells are bolted to the motor's frame. Now that we've identified the parts of a typical DC motor, let's look at how DC motors can be classified. There are three basic types of DC motors, series motors, shunt motors, and compound motors. These classifications are based on the way that the field coils in each motor are connected to the armature. The external appearance of all DC motors is very similar, but there are several ways to distinguish one type of motor from another. For example, this is a nameplate from a typical DC motor. The entry in the block labeled wound identifies the type of motor it is. In this example, the block contains the letters CPD, which means that the motor is a compound motor. You can also determine what type of motor is by referring to a schematic diagram in the manufacturer's manual. This schematic diagram represents a series motor. In a series motor, the field coils, which are also referred to as the series field, are connected in series with the armature. So in a series motor, there is only one path for current flow. Each coil in a series field is usually made of a few turns of large wire so series fields have very low resistance. In this type of motor, the armature also has a very low resistance, so the current flow through the motor is very high. This schematic uses standard markings to identify the fields in the motor. The letter S means series, and the letter A means armature. 
The leads from the series field in this example are marked S1 and S2, and the armature is marked A1 and A2. The numbers following the letters indicate the direction of current flow, which is from 1 to 2. For example, A1 could be assumed to be negative, and S2 could be assumed to be positive. The primary purpose of the markings is to ensure that when the motor connections are made, current flow through the motor will be in the proper direction. The same markings are used to identify the motor's leads. So you can also determine what type of DC motor is by examining its leads. Now this is a schematic of a typical shunt motor. The letter F means shunt. So the shunt field is marked F1 and F2 and the armature is marked A1 and A2. In a shunt motor, the field coils and the armature are always connected in parallel with each other. So in this particular motor, there are two paths for current flow. Each coil in a shunt field is usually made of many turns of fine wire, so the resistance in the shunt field is very high. 